promises. So the next speaker is Bas Peters from the Rabo University, and we will be talking about uh, Gulf of Spectra and Growth and Heat Toposes geometrically. So, is that fun? Thank you. So, I mean, this is the same talk because it's joint work together with the organizers. So, <laughs> and, and, and the chairman. Um, and, and also together with Steve, of course. Um, so, Thank you very much to Nadish for giving my complete introduction. <laughs> Speed up a lot. Um, so yeah, this is what we're trying to do, to relate um, algebraic, algebraic quantum mechanics to topos theory to, to get a new foundation for quantum logic and quantum spaces. So this was already in our first paper together with um, Glass and, uh, and Chris Finn. And to get a spectral invariant for non-community development. Um, well, you've heard all this. Um, the only extra point is that um, we also have a direct measure on in classical. Well, we also have a measure uh, apart from the geometric structure, which also shows up in um, non-commutative uh, geometry. Um, so this is the structure of classical uh, classical physics, or, or this is a way classical physics can be axiomatized. So we have the phase space. We have a subset of propositions, either the opens or the. Um, this is okay for you because for me that it seems to wiggle a bit. You can lower the rest. It's okay. Um, so we have some subset of uh, propositions. They could be the, the opens. Um, we have states which are defined in terms of um, sigma. Um, given we have propositions, so given an interval and an observable, we can combine them into a proposition just by taking the inverse image and we have a pairing map um, given, uh, given a state in a subset um, that tells us what, what it is actually happens. Now this was the starting point for von Neumann and von Neumann actually he, generally, he proposed the following so this is von Neumann's von Neumann work of quantum uh, logic. So we have a, a quantum phase space, we have Elementary propositions as closed linear subspaces, you have pure spaces, pure states as the unit vectors, the closed uh, linear subspaces, and we have the bearing map of the Born group. And well, we all know why, uh, why we are bending this. So our motivation is precisely what Nadish presented with. Um, so we want to relate C star algebras to locales and toposes to get. Uh, algebraic quantum theory to, to combine them using algebraic quantum theory, Gelfand duality, and Bohr's doctrine of the classical concepts. And this, this is the motivation from our Alan's uh, And well, as, as most of you know, so this is the way we set things up. Um, so we have this O set. Um, we've seen all of this. Uh, this was dormant in. Sanders presentation. So actually, what you get is um, by the dasanization, you get maps into the interval. Domain. So this can actually be defined internally. Of course, dasanization is very commonly um, available in the in the imperial approach. Um, so given an element in the interval domain. So so sorry, but I'm not completely sure that it was dormant there as I was working. Contravariantly, if I had a public number of spaces, then I could use the interval domain and still have everything continuous. But I'm not sure it worked exactly. It would work. No, no, it's, it's not not exactly there. So it's it's slightly different. The only thing I want to emphasize is that for us internally, we get an element in the interval domain. But I, I won't say any more about the. Uh, the dasanization, which is a beautiful word, of course. Um, and we can define a, a state proposition pairing because, uh, given a state, we can define an internal integral and then we can pair it with a proposition and then we can wonder whether this actually has proposition 
sorry, this, this actually has measure one or has uh, strictly positive measure one? Um, and of course, all of this was strongly motivated by the um, uh, Butterfield during an ICM use of topos theory for quantum theory. Um, so, Steve has given a, a beautiful uh, presentation about the use of vibrations and of vibrations. And indeed, so what we want is to have an internal uh, spectrum, and therefore, we're forced, or more or less forced, to use. Um, the covariant approach, whereas uh, the uh, imperial guys or the no imperial Oxford guys are using the, uh, um, the contravariant approach. Um, there is perhaps a philosophical or, or motivational difference that what we're using is Kripke models. So if we um, have a smaller element, then there's actually something that contains more information. So this seems to fit with the uh, um, Kripkean motivation for the use of Kripke models. And for any Kripke model, you can always define a co-Kripke model. And this seems to be what um, what the imperial guys are doing. But we can discuss this later. So, 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 so this at least for me is, is one way of understanding the difference. Yeah. We can discuss this. Yeah. Say a smaller that contains more information. The smaller elements are still the smaller even subtraction. No, they're the bigger. Because we um, we we change twice. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so so if you make them into three sheets then we would opt them and then the uh, smaller elements would be the bigger algebras. And bigger algebras contain more information. So what, what we're doing, I mean, one other way of seeing why internal reasoning works for us is that what we're doing seems to fit with what Kripke, uh, with the Kripke style of doing things. Um, so, we've seen most of this before. Um, an in internal C star algebra is just a functor from the underlying category to the category of C star algebras. So you can think of it as a, a bundle of C star algebras. And then morphication is a map like so, just a topological map. Um, what is nice is that this gives us an internal C star algebra, and this one is commutative because of the local pictures. And this is the Borean perspective. But we've seen this so often that I'm, I'm, I'm speeding up. Um, of course, we have coach and specker, so there are no hidden variables in quantum mechanics, and this is for you all know what it means. So it's impossible to assign a value to all the um, all the uh, variables in an intrinsic and independent way. And mathematically, it's it's this, and it's the one of the contributions of Andreas and um, and Chris Chris Eichem to see that this can actually be nicely expressed. Not so, so in the earlier work by uh, um, Butterfield and Eichem, um, this, this category was used. Uh, the category that was used based on this, uh, based on a monoid. And only in the work uh, with Andre in, sorry, only in the work with Andreas, there was the introduction of the community of That's correct, isn't it? No, in the paper, that's where Okay, so it's for all the things similar to this. Yeah, that's the paper with Hamilton. Yes. Okay. So thanks for the correction. Um, so we know there's no global section. Um, but still, we have the possibility to have a neo realistic interpretation uh, by considering also, also non global sections. I have to object with that. I'm sorry. Because we made up this word. This is not what we call it. This is not. Uh, so, so I want to generalize the word neorealistic to mean um, we're allowed to use non global sections. Okay, then it's, then it's not what we originally meant. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, the, the sentence is supposed to continue. So, the, the word neorealistic was 
also introduced by Aisha Mandarin, or maybe even earlier. Um, so we want to consider the phase space of the borification, so this will be um, uh, the spectrum of the internal C star algebra, and for this we will want to use constructive Galpin duality. Um, so the introduction will be uh, still a bit of things that uh, you may have seen before. Um, but I, I don't think that this has been emphasized um, in the last uh, two days, so I, I want to say it again. Um, so the classical proof of Galpin duality uses the axiom of choice. So you can, uh, but only to construct the points in the spectrum. But if you want, so you can avoid the use of the axiom of choice by using locales. Uh, I think it, it was more or less implicit in Steve's presentation also. Um, so we use topological spaces for our points. And this has been a very powerful uh, tool. So a lot of things, a lot of theorems in functional analysis, uh, Tikhonov, Prime Milman, Alaoglu, Hanbana, Gelfand, Sarisky, can all be done without using the axiom of choice. So this is a very strong methodology. And I think it was initially um, introduced by André Gérial. Um, there's a whole industry of papers uh, by Mulvey and collaborators. Um, Jerry Kukon has put it in a more uh, predicative context, and this is where, uh, where I picked it up. So it's, I learned most of what I did uh, in collaboration with, uh, with Jerry Kukon. Um, what I want to emphasize is that there are actually there are two ways, and this is a, a motivation that you could also see um, perhaps dormant in the, in the introduction by Nabi. Um, so there, there are two formal approaches to topology. One you consider the formal opens, and the other one is you consider commutative C star algebra. So they're both algebraic in flavor. Um, and this is nice because in computer science you have the, the theoretic domains which fits with the formal opens, formal topology, and the formal continuous functions, they're the, of course, the, the formal continuous functions, so they're the, the observable. Um, so as an introduction to, um, so what I want to do is to um, and this was motivated already in the uh, presentation by Steve Vickers, is um, to give a, a geometric presentation of the spectrum. And this was done already um, in part uh, in the initial work with Kofa. Um, but for this I need to introduce a new gadget, a new algebraic gadget, um, the theorems of spaces And this is a, an alternative way of introducing uh, real C-star so they will be real, actually, like real pre star algebras because what we're axiomatizing is the, uh, the addition together with the lattice operation. So it, you should think of pointwise uh, point meet and join with, of course, this holds for um, on the real line and therefore you can, uh, it also holds pointwise for functions. So the definition of a real space will be a vector lattice, so it's, it's uh, a vector space with compatible lattice operations. Now, given such a, a re space, we also assume that it has a strong unit, so this will be like the unit of a C star algebra. Um, it's called one, but there's actually no reason to call it one because it's, there's no way to actually multi uh, do multiplication. So it's, it's just one element such that you have the Archimedean uh, principle. So given a, given a function, you can if you take the unit, you can multiply it by a, um, a number of times the natural number n, and then you get on top of this function. So this basically means that all the formal continuous functions here, they're bounded. Yeah, this, the motivation is still and now what we see, just like any um, real C-star algebra, real commutative C-star algebra, is a space of functions. Also, the, the re-space will be a, a space of functions. 
The only thing is that we don't have completeness, so we will only get an adjunction and we won't get um, equivalence. Um, so, a re-space hom homomorphism is a map from the re-space, uh, a re-space morphism to the real line. So it's just a map that preserves all the re-space structure. And the most important Reese homomorphisms are the maps, are the point evaluations. So given a function and a point, we just evaluate it in a point. I mean, most of you will be familiar with Gelfman duality, so this is just the, uh, the Gelfman map, but now applied to Reese spaces instead of C star spaces. So the homomorphism, it has, it has to preserve one as well, is that right? It preserves one as well, yes. So you work in the real part, so to say. Yeah. yeah. So what we, if you take a C star algebra, then uh, and you look at the real part of the C star algebra, that will be an example of a race space. Uh, I'll explain why we use race spaces. Um, so the classical version of the Stone Yoshida theorem. So so this is Marshall Stone. Um, so given a real space and consider the space of all its representations, um, then this is compact Hausdorff and the Ries embedding defined like so. Uh, sorry, and there is a Ries embedding defined like so. Um, and the uniform norm on the Ries space equals the uniform norm that you get here. So this is precisely why you have to uh, have to preserve one. Because that allows you to And now, so what I want to emphasize is that the uh, definition of the spectrum by generators and relations is really simple. And it is really simple because you get the, uh, the join here. Um, let's, let's be a bit slower. Um, so you can think, so, so we're defining the locale of presentations. And the interpretation of this formal open, this element of the uh, of the locale, the generator of the locale, will be all the real space morphisms such that if you evaluate A or the Gelfand transform of A in that point, it will be strictly bigger than zero. So it's just like what you do in the, uh, in the Gelfand transform. Um, and of course, yeah, so this is just defined in the usual Gelfand way. So you write down the, um, the relations given all these generators, so the generators are given by the elements of the re space. And what makes thing this very easy is that is this fifth axiom, but to some sense also the third, that we can um, directly express the points where A or B are, uh, are positive, which are, is precisely the join of the points where A and B are both. Oh, sorry, where either A or B is positive. Yeah. So this is a very nice algebraic construction, and this is the only infinitary action. So that's, uh, that's also needed. Um, now this is compact, so please don't forget about the uh, self-adjoint part here. So this is actually meant to suggest that if you take a um, C star algebra and its self adjoint part, and this actually works. Um, if you take the, uh, the spectrum of, um, of A, this will be compact and completely regular, compact Hausdorff. Um, so, but this gives a direct point free description of the uh, space of representations. And what follows from this is the fact that every commutative C star algebra is a C star algebra. So this was the constructive variants of this were um, first work uh, on this was done by Vanusevsky and Mulvey, then the step was made by Cherkoka, and finally the, the last bit was done by us together. Um, so this is we, we provide the first completely constructive proof. So that works for all toposes. And moreover, it's what's also important is that it's geometric. And that's the problem with the, um, it's geometric in precisely the way that this was defined by, uh, by Steve Vickers in the 
last one. And I'll, I'll explain why this is important. Uh, so this gives us the, uh, our internal spectrum, our equivalent of the uh, spectral P sheet. Um, and what well, is the, the phase of this? So, as we know, that this, is the, this has no global sections, but it is a well defined, interesting, compact, regular local. So, it, for us, it has a lot of structure. And this is also what we saw in the, in the presentation by Steve Papers that we do get a, a, a compact, regular local. Um, yeah, before I, I do the computations, um, let me emphasize again why um, why it's important that we. Oh, sorry, I'm going to get Let me emphasize again why this is important that this is geometric, because this means that it uh, can be computed fiber-wise, and now that we know that we can easily vary the underlying category, so for instance by putting a topology on it or putting a group action on it, this construction will continue to work because it's, uh, it's geometric, it will just be computed fiber-wise. So this is very stable. Whereas if you look at the, um, uh, the alternative definition of the spectrum of a C-star algebra, uh, that one will, be, will not be stable um, and that's because the, um, the structure, the completeness, if you pull it back over a geometric morphism, you will not get completeness. And this is already an old observation by Banaszewski and Lowe. So what is nice is that because the structure of a Ries space is fully algebraic, plus if you take the vector lattice to be a, a rational vector lattice, then this whole structure will always be preserved when you pull it back over a geometric morphism. So this means that this computation is done once and for all and we can uh, modify the underlying category as much as we like. But this will just be, uh, the computation will be the same. So now there was a question by class, so what, what actually does this, um, does this space look like? So we have Sigma over the ideals of CA. Can we understand what this space looks like? So we, before we just gave it a fully formal construction, just as a uh, an element in the topos. But now we want to understand. So what does it look like externally? Um, now, as you know or may know, if you look look at locales in the sheaf topos, then this is actually equivalent to locale maps to the underlying space. So our locale will just be, as was also presented by the Steve Akers, it will just be a, a locale map from sigma to the ideals in CA and moreover um, this will be computed bundle-wise. Uh, yeah, so we I said this before, so we have a geometric construction. Um, now another question is, um, so does this space actually, is it spatial? Or is it, uh, so a priori it may not have any points at all. Um, but it turns out that it's spatial, so it has enough points. Um, but you can actually prove Quite a lot more. We can prove that it's locally compact and even constructively so. Constructively it's very difficult to prove that, in, in general, to prove that the locale is spatial, but proving that it's locally compact is usually um, fairly doable. So um, locally compact is a very good notion for a, a very good replacement for, um, sorry, um, local, locally compact is far more um, stable than speciality. So there is a replacement for speciality that I won't mention. Um, so classically, if you have the axiom of choice, then locally compact locales are uh, 
special. So we actually get, uh, so, so actually the result is implied by what we have here. So it's constructively locally compact. And we're going to prove it as follows. So we know by construction that sigma is locally, it's compact regular and sheaves over the ideals of CA with the Scott topology. Um, maybe I should repeat what was said by Steve Vickers that um, we have that sets to the, to the P um, it's equivalent to C over the ideals in P with the Scott topology. So this is what we're using. So we're actually a priori we're working in sets to the P where P is the uh, commutative sub-algebras but instead we uh, because we want to work with an underlying locale we want to work with a sheaf topos we're working in um, sheaves over uh, the ideal space with the Scott topology and as I said we can, can vary this if we for instance put the um, the, the topology on, on CA the, the one that uh, is given by the, the flag manifold, the same construction will work. And the same result that we have here will work. So we can change the topology uh, on P, but still our externalization will remain uh, locally compact. So these are the ingredients. So sigma will be compact regular by construction in the sheaf topos. For any post set, the ideal space is locally compact and now locally compact maps compose um, one thing I should say is that um, we can characterize um, by this equivalence there are a lot of things you can say about um, the internal uh, presentation here and this was also present in the, in the presentation by Steve that you um, look at discrete locales as certain uh, maps downstairs, and also the compact, sorry, the compact regular uh, idea. What is it? The vibrations. Um, so likewise, here you can. Uh, there, there are several properties of lo of internal locales that just directly translate to properties of the maps here. Um, for instance. Um, Compact internal compact locales correspond to perfect maps, and internal compact regular locales correspond to proper maps. Uh, and now we have something similar. We have a locally compact uh, internal locally compact locale. So we want to. Uh, so we have an internal locally compact map. And now we have. So now we have two because sigma is locally compact over this ideal space and this one is locally compact uh, over one so now the general theorem that we want is to show that this one is locally compact and how do we do this? we prove in general that whatever is underneath here and this, this will be important later on um, so we can vary this and that, that there's a good motivation for this for varying it um, Whatever is underneath here, whatever topos we're working in, this composition is again locally compact. So this is again a very stable theorem. So we're going to prove that locally compact maps compose. And then we have classical speciality, but I mean the constructive local compactness is much more important. Uh, yeah, so one, one consequence of this um, Geometric construction is that the space can be computed uh, fiber-wise. So the points here will be an ideal in here plus uh, plus the spectrum that's directly over there. So if you take a uh, a prime ideal, uh, sorry, if you take a, a principal ideal, then it will just be a pair like so. So you take a principal ideal given by a commutative subalgebra, and then you take a point of its spectrum. And more generally, you will want to take an ideal in this space here.
So what we want to do is prove that this one is locally compact. Now the following are equivalent. Y is locally compact. The exponential with the Sierpinski space exists. And Y is exponential for any space. So we can take uh, X to the Y for any uh, space. So this is the theorem we proved. So this is basically this says that locally compact maps compose. So suppose that y is locally compact in C over x, where p is p is this map. So we write y p for y in x. So if y is locally compact in sheets over x and x is locally compact, then the composition is locally compact. And the proof is this picture. So we need to construct I make this better. Um, I must have seen this before. <laughs> you, you've seen this before. It's, it's a joint paper. <laughs> uh, so we want to construct the uh, the opens of Y. So, what should an open of Y look like? Um, so, an open of Y here. What happens? So, we um, take. I'll make it more precise in a minute. So, we, we take an open of Y here. Now, what happens if we? Uh, project it here, then we get a space here. Now what you want to do is move it upside here and this one you can actually construct. So this is the Sierpinski space over X. And because Y is locally compact we have the exponent in C over X. locally compact in sheaves over x, therefore this thing exists. Sipinski space and also exponentiation, if it exists, is computed bundle-wise because it's a, sorry, fiber-wise because it's a geometric construction. So that makes a lot of things much easier. So Sipinski space and exponentiation by Sipinski is geometric. So that's an easy computation. Um, we are assuming that P so we are somehow using the fact that P is an open map. So it's in the, the image of U is open in X. Is that part um, of the point? And then take the inverse image out of Q. I don't think we need it, but in any case it's going to be true. Right. Um, okay, so and we want to have a global section of this. So we want to have a map upstairs and going back. I'll do this point wise in a minute and then you can directly see that everything just works out. Um, so this is what you write down if you argue point wise. The nice thing is that this proof actually works because um, the continuous map will be a constructive transformation of points. So this is the methodology that was explained by Steve in a previous lecture. So even if this space doesn't have any point and this space doesn't have any point, that doesn't matter because you can still write down maps from pointless spaces to pointless spaces by just um, manipulating with points. And a continuous map like so can also be seen by looking at the fibers uh, as a bundle. So those are the two insights. So y here is given by a theory with generalized models. You take an element of x and you take an element of the fiber over x. Yeah, that's what it means for y to be a space over, um, over x. So 
that this be the external description of this internal gadget. Because the exponent is geometric, this will just be computed uh, point wise. So we will have a point downstairs and we have something in the fiber over it. This is the point here. So we have a W in uh, Sapinski to the Y over X. So it's the, the pre-image of the, uh, the map P. Now we define E to be all those sections of this map. So all the maps that if we um, go up and go back down, we have the identity. Now it's it seems that we're just manipulating points, but that's not the case. I mean, all of this can be done geometrically, and therefore this actually is a definition of a space of a locale, even if x and y are not locales. Um, and that's so the ingredient we need is that this actually is a space by local compactness. So this again this one is locally compact and therefore we can exponentiate it and this is again a space. So that's an important observation. So E actually defines a space. Now it's easy so now we've defined our space E, which is supposed to be the um, external exponent. Now, of course, we have to check that it actually is the uh, satisfies the inertia properties. I hope this is not an omen. I think is it because yes, you're leaving on the switch. It's, it's me. Okay. <laughs> um, so what we need to do is to. Um, define an evaluation map, because we're arguing that it, it is the, um, the exponent. So given a point in Y, we should get an element of Sierpinski. But of course we should get an element of Sierpinski over X. So this is just the, uh, the way we define this map. And then we compose it with <coughs> This map to end up in Sapinski space. Yeah. Uh, you can check the, uh, the easy laws, but it's, so what I want to present is mostly that this is a very simple definition, a very simple and pointwise definition. And what we use here is again that the evaluation is geometric, um, so that we actually get this evaluation map. So we just work with point, work as if there were points. Um, so we need to do two things. We need to define an evaluation map and we need to define an uncurry map. And this one, um, so we have those two maps. And so this set of satisfy the right universal properties. So we've now proved with these easy definitions um, that we actually have constructed the uh, exponent with Sipinski space. And this means that y is locally complex. So this is actually a very simple proof, but the, uh, the statement is not simple. Um, and so why do I say that this is a simple proof? So an alternative way of uh, defining local compactness is by showing that we, we use this way below relation. So local compactness is, um, <coughs> so you get a, a continuous lapse. Um, so you need this way below relation, and if you actually want to explicitly compute the way, be way below relation on Y, that co becomes quite complicated. Uh, so we have a proof that uses the way below relation, uh, but this one using the Sapinski space, it's, it's much nicer. And so why is this difficult? Because the definition of the way below relation uses the power set. Um, so it quantifies over subsets. And Using the power set, it's not geometric, and therefore to, uh, it's, it doesn't generalize easily. So this is what I said. So we have 
um, this correspondence between perfect maps and internal compact locales, locally, uh, locally perfect maps to internal locally compact locales. So we, what we have proved is that locally perfect maps compose. Um, this needs, if you actually want to interpret this in a topological space, you need some separation properties on the, uh, on the space. Um, and so we get the result that we were looking out for. So the external spectrum is locally compact and therefore it's by classical logic is special. Now we've done this construction and we want to do a similar argument for valuations. And this is something that uh, Steve already hinted at. So if we have some nice operational locales, then again it will be uh, computed uh, particle wise and so it's this value uh, given a locale you can compute the locale evaluations and you can improve it down here. Uh, how much time do I have? Just uh, 15 minutes? But yes, yeah. Um, so, and, and what I want to connect to is uh, this idea that we have an integral uh, is of course just a positive linear functional on a commutative C star algebra and a state is a positive linear functional on a general C star algebra. And then it was known to Mackie that um, only the quasi states were, um, can be motivated from first principles in quantum theory. And this was the motivation uh, for the question to Gleason Gleason proved that quasar states and states are actually are actually the same thing. So it's the dimension of the Hilbert space is bigger than zero. And this is the, the start of the quotient space theory. So quasar states are a very natural equation. It says two there, but you said zero. Right. Sorry. Uh, it says two there, but I thought you said zero. So what? No, no, I mean two. It means two. And what happens at two? Is it just not true? It's not true, yes. Like in, in coach and spec, we also need... Uh, in coach and spec, we always need this condition that the dimension of the whole space is bigger than okay. So, it's, I mean, it's the same, same idea. Um, now, there's a theorem that, um, that is important, is that we have a one-one correspondence between quasi-states on a and integrals internally on the space of continuous functions here. And what I want to emphasize is that this is in, in close connection to what was done by uh, Siegel and Kunz um, in their integration theory. Of course, Siegel was, was a great mathematical physicist and he developed this theory of integration on a completely, uh, as much um, algebraic as he could. Um, with the idea of that this would be a first step towards applying it to, uh, to quantum theory. Um, and the idea would be that the expectation, so the, uh, the state here would be the expectation in measure theory. So that's, it's a nice book. And I will present a variation of this. Um, so an integral is just a positive linear functional and it's, it's very similar to what you get for Daniel integral. And the prime example is just the Lebesgue integral on the space of continuous function. So if you want, just the Cauchy integral. Um, so what we did, and there's a, um, as Steve mentioned, so this is similar to the Givy monad. So what we do is we work on uh, compact regular spaces, um, where you get a nice, um, the nice correspondence between Integral, integrals taking values in the dedicant reals, whereas the generalization to all locales that Steve mentioned, um, you only get a map from integrals to the, what is it, the lower reals. Um, but in both cases, evaluation will be a map to the lower reals. So it's semi-continuous and satisfies the modular laws. Um, if X is compact regular, then actually this can be extended to a um, a regular measure. 
Um, so what is nice is, what I want to emphasize is the, the structure of the proof here, um, that you actually, you define the locale of integrals and the locale of valuations, and then you show that they are point-wise homeomorphic, and this can be done by a purely logical reading of the, um, of the, so what we do is we formulate both of these spaces geometrically, and now we know that there is a classical proof that these two, uh, that integrals and valuations are the same, and therefore there will be a constructive proof. That doesn't give you a way of getting the constructive proof, but once you've formulated everything geometrically, um, it's usual just, uh, this geometrical formulation just guides you the way of actually giving a proof. And what you can see is that the proof you get is actually, it's smoother than the, uh, the classical proof. You follow the proof, but there's some, some simple conditions. So, uh, technically what's going on here is the, uh, we use bars theorem, which says that if you... If you have a geometrical statement with a classical proof, and the, the proof can be as classical as you want, you can use axiom of choice, then there will also be a, a constructive proof. But obviously, or maybe not so obviously, there's actually no way of actually getting to the uh, constructive proof. But in practice, it turns out that it's often possible to find it. Well, I, I thought you'd written down this proof in a purely geometric form. No, that's what I said. So. We've so you, you didn't actually need Bar's theorem in all No, no, cases. so the thing, the methodology is, um, we have this classical theorem. Now, we state it geometrically, and then by Bar's theorem, we know that there should be a constructive proof. Yeah. But, but, you, one, but you found it anyway. But, but given the geometric formulation, it's usually straightforward because of this nice... Um, the nice properties of geometric logic and some cut elimination results and so on. It's usually quite easy to actually find the proof. There was actually, I mean, there, there are some insights in the proof which actually make it simpler than the classical proof. And, um, we, we did some algebraic computations which also make it easier. Um, but what I want to emphasize is this methodology that if you have a classical proof, you can often reformulate it geometrically and then by an appeal to bars theorem, this actually gives you a very strong motivation for looking for this actual construction. Um, yeah, so the important thing is that you have to formulate it in such a way that it doesn't use dependent choice because it, uh, this is not present in geometric logic. Um, so that is the, uh, the Gini monad for the main theory in logical form. And it's, there is a generalization that Steve presented. So what is nice again that this is a geometric construction, um, and again we can apply the theorem to see that uh, this is also this map is also locally compact, and this will stay locally compact even if we put a topology on here. So again, this is something that's very stable under the under the changes of the the base category. So it's a very stable result. Um, also, because we're moving internally from one to the other, um, we can move internally from the space of integrals to the space of valuations. Um, so it's all very canonical, and, and there's all those things we can change. Um, so here's one motivation. We saw a couple of other motivations for actually changing the underlying category. So instead of a post set, we may want to make it into an actual category. Um, we may want to put a topology on it. Uh, we may want to look at uh, algebraic quantum field theory. So algebraic quantum field theory gives you a, a local net. So a functor from Minkowski, the post setup of opens of Minkowski space to the category of C-star algebras. So this gives you a C-star algebra in the pre sheaf topos um, uh, over M2 sets. So this is an internal C-star algebra in here. So we can verify and then repeat the whole story. So the nice thing is that we can now change uh, the one we have here with uh,
associated to each space time region and all the green ones. So, so we probably uh, the base carry of the pulsar should be something like OM times um, the even sub region. Where's the abelian? Oh, uh, so, yeah. no, no. So we have. We still need to borify, but since we're in a uh, topos, and since everything I presented is constructive, we can just do it again in this topos. Okay. So we have a an algebra. Now, in this topos, we build a new topos, okay. and in that topos, it will be commuted. Yeah, right. Isn't this a little bit off because uh, if you consider a space of classical field? then that's not locally compact unless the, the space is zero dimension. Oh, yeah, sorry, that's right. Um, but in this case it is locally compact. Or no, sorry, sorry. So the result I was mentioning, I haven't actually done the computations. Um, it will be locally compact over this. Um, and I believe you're right, so, so this actually is not. Uh, no, sorry. So this is locally compact because it's an ideal completion of of a poster. So this, yeah, so this, this is locally compact, but that doesn't mean that the actual manifold is locally. Does that answer the question? Yeah. yeah. You have just about five minutes. Yeah. Oh, I'm wrapping up. Thinking. No, no. So <laughs> uh, there are two sentences. I mean, there, there are two people present here that have pursued this line of reasoning. Uh, so Joost has written a very nice special thesis on this topic. Uh, so read the paper, it's very nice. And Sandra has promised a nice paper together with Hans Halverson. I don't think it's ready yet. At least you have results in this direction. I promised I'd try to get a nice paper. Okay. But you do have some results. Yeah. So this is extra encouragement for you to, uh, to write that. Um, yeah, so what I want to emphasize is that this is because we can now freely um, change the base topos, this is an advantage of constructive and geometric reasoning. So these are the conclusions. So we have a functor, um, so we get spatial quantum logic via topos logic. Uh, yeah, we use internal Galvan duality. We get intuitionistic quantum logic, which is what uh, Corning has presented also. Um, we get the spectral invariant, so this was nicely presented by Nadish, and we get states as non-commutative integrals. So these non-commutative integrals become internal integrals. And because we use all this geometric reasoning, uh, we can do everything nicely fiber-wise, so things are very stable, so all the changes of the base can, and the computations are really easy. So, thank you very much. of uh, questions, burning questions. Can I have at least one? Um, <clears throat> there was one slide with some propaganda for uh, uh, point free topology, axiom of choice, using axiom of choice as a choice. Now for, uh, since I've had a classical upbringing like a lot of people working in this opus like stuff and I've been waiting for at least for three years for some systematic treatment in the form of a book covering functional, basic functional analysis in a point free approach accessible for people that have a more classical background so are you the right one to write such a thing or any of uh, These people, I guess I need, a, I need a PhD student and then I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think such a book would be a long overdue with it. You think Chris Mott is the person to write it? Yes. But I don't know whether he still has the energy to no, do it. No, I don't. Uh, but obviously, yes. We could kidnap him and put him in a cellar and release him only if he finishes it. For the sake of science. But well, there is a book somewhat in your direction by. Arnar van Rooy, who was a professor of analysis here, and Ben de Pachter, who tried to prove as much as possible in a constructive way functional analysis. For example, take Han Bama, they proved that only for 
temporal, temporal space. Yeah. 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 Yeah.